My dear and beloved in Christ, today as we celebrate the feast of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary, we witness the fulfillment of our Lord's words. He who humbles himself shall be exalted. As a reward for her profound humility, God crowned her as Queen of Heaven and made all things subject to her power and dominion. What is the virtue of humility? According to Father Patrick Garon, humility is a true estimate and frank acknowledgement of our littleness. Humility consists in our realizing precisely what we are before God and in acting and keeping with that knowledge. We realize that all the good in us comes from God and we act in accordance with that knowledge. St. Augustine said, Humility is the foundation of all the other virtues. Hence, in the soul in which this virtue does not exist, there cannot be any other virtue except in mere appearance. Similarly, it's the best disposition to receive celestial gifts. Finally, it's so necessary for perfection that among all the ways to reach it, the first is humility, the second is humility, and the third is humility. My dear and beloved in Christ, humility and love of God form the foundation of the spiritual life and our dealings with him. In addition to his infinite goodness and mercy, God is infinitely just. All our gifts of body and soul come from him. When we forget this, seek inordinately the praise, respect, and esteem of others and take credit for our good works, we are dishonest. Since God is infinitely just, he cannot tolerate dishonesty. God resists the proud but gives grace to the humbles, writes St. Paul. To illustrate this lesson, Christ chose two polar opposites, a Pharisee and a publican. The Pharisees were hypocrites who considered themselves to be saints. Blinded by pride, they looked upon all others as sinners. According to themselves, they alone faithfully observed the law. The Pharisees seemed per seemingly performed many good works, but their motive was merely to be honored and respected by others. Instead of seeking the glory of God, they were driven by pride and vainglory. Even in prayer, their odious pride offended God. The Pharisees were deemed blameworthy by God because they took pride in their good works and gloried in them as though they had performed them by their own power. In Holy Scripture, God repeatedly condemns pride, the root of of all sins, and warns us against it. In the book of Ecclesiasticus, we read, Pride is hateful before God and men. The whole life and teaching of Jesus Christ condemn pride in every shape and form. Our Lord said, Learn of me, because I am meek and humble of heart. My dear and beloved in Christ, in nature, the hardest granite can be worn down by the silent but persistent power of wind and water. So it is with the spiritual life because pride is the solvent of all virtues. When linked to great intellectual attainments, as in the case of Lucifer, pride is deadly. Atheism, infidelity, presumption, hypocrisy, heresy, envy, boasting, all of these find their basis in pride. St. Paul asked, What hast thou that thou hast not received? We may have an intellect superior to that of our neighbor, but God gave us that intellect. We may have vocal cords superior to those of our neighbor, but it was God who gave us those vocal cords. In this field of athletics, we may be able to jump higher or run faster or be stronger than our neighbor, but God bestowed these gifts upon us. Since God has given us everything we have and everything we are, we must recognize our total dependence upon him, our total subjection to him. We can still be humble while at the same time recognizing our gifts, talents, and abilities. If we're gifted with outstanding accomplishments, it's not a sign of humility if we deny it. In fact, to deny it would not be in harmony with the truth. 
if we can sing beautifully or play an instrument well, it's not a mark of humility to protest that we cannot. When the truly humble person contemplates the gifts and graces of God in himself, he appreciates the goodness and mercy of God toward him. He's ever, ever mindful of what a worthless creature he is in himself and that he owes all good things to God. If we're truly humble, we understand our dependence upon Almighty God and acknowledge that all good comes from him. We realize it is God who has fashioned us and showered us with constant care, love, and mercy. If we practice the virtue of humility, we take full responsibility for our sins, our bad example to others, and our rejection of grace. Sadly, even though we've received so many free and extraordinary gifts from God, we can easily become proud and self-centered. Oh, the malice of pride to expect people to praise me as if I alone were responsible for all my gifts of body and soul. What arrogance on my part to look upon the less favored neighbor. When I fail to give praise to God and attempt to abrogate things for myself, seeking the praise and notice of others, I'm asking, acting dishonestly. Not only has God given me all these things, but he has given me the help to make use of these things. I need energy to raise my hand. God gives me that energy. I need energy to think and move. God gave me that energy. Our Lord described our utter helplessness when he said, without me, you can do nothing. We need God's grace to do anything of a supernatural nature. That is an act that's deserving of a heavenly reward. I'm free to reject God's help, but the fact remains that I need it. My dearly beloved in Christ, when we try to abrogate to ourselves praise and esteem for our many good qualities or want to be noticed for our work and good deeds, we're simply, simply acting a lie. We sin against the truth because the truth is all these are from God. But the proud person like to put God in the background. Have you heard the story of the fly on the chariot wheel going along a sandy road? Clouds of dust are being raised by the speeding chariot. But the fly and the axle, flapping its wings, cried out with intense self-admiration, I'm doing all this. I'm raising all the dust. <laughs> Instead of humbling ourselves and showing gratitude for the gifts God has lavished upon us, how many of us boast of our achievements? We are only a small fish in a big pond. In our own little surroundings, we can crave to be praised and noticed for our accomplishments. We may strive to outshine others to seek their praise and admiration. My dearly beloved in Christ, pride can be so subtle. Some people seek recognition and honor from others by constantly praising themselves in their speech. Their conversation consists of I, I, I. Others are more clever and manipulative. They patiently wait for the right moment to slip in a few remarks that would redound to their honor. Truly, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It is secret self-importance that brings boasting to our lips. That boasting that makes us look so ridiculous in the eyes of others. My dearly beloved in Christ, in Holy Scripture, God shows his abhorrence of pride. He overthrew Pharaoh. He humbled Nebuchadnezzar to the point that he was reduced to eating grass like cows. There's also the case of Joseph and his brothers. They were jealous of him. And jealousy comes from pride. So they sold him into captivity. But God followed up their sin by punishing them. And so it is with one instance after another in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, there's the example of King Herod, who was actually eaten by worms 
because people began to say that he was a god. Pride comes before the fall. It was truly under divine inspiration that Our Lady said, He has scattered the proud in the conceit of their heart. I'll close with a story from one of the dreams of St. John Bosco. He had a dream in which an angel transported him and a group of people who were with him to a large open plain. The angel told the saint that they were here to learn a crucial lesson and warned him of the great danger in the form of a bull which was soon to come upon the group. The angel commanded, Call your followers to your side, warn them carefully, and ask them to lie flat with their faces to the earth as soon as they hear the deafening roar of the bull, and to remain in such a position until the bull has gone by. Woe to the one who does not pay heed to your voice. He who does not lie with his face to the ground shall be lost. For we read in Holy Scripture, he who humbles himself shall be exalted, and he who exalts himself shall be humbled. Then he added, quick, quick, the bull is about to come. Shout at the top of your voice and bid all your all lower themselves. And then St. John Bosco said, I yelled out, and he kept on saying, keep it up, take courage and cry out even louder, shout, shout. I shouted myself hoarse, and I'm afraid I even woke up Father Lemoyne, who was sleeping in the adjacent room. I was not capable of doing more. After a moment, we heard the distant bellow of the bull, whereupon the personage began, Look out! Look out! Arrange them in two lines close to one another, with a space in between for the bull to pass through. I shouted out the required or orders. In a split second, all were lying flat with their face to the ground. From the hazy horizon, we noticed the wild bull rapidly advancing. Although the majority of us had fallen on their faces, a few, led by curiosity, wanted to see what sort of thing this bull was. And so they refused to follow our example. The, that personage then turned to me and said, now you will see what's going to befall these individuals. You will see what they will receive for not obeying orders, for not humbling themselves. I wished at all costs to warn them once again, to shout out to them and to run to their aid, but the personage forbade me to do so. Once again, I insisted on approaching them, whereupon he addressed me in a commanding tone. You too are bound to obedience. Down. Fall on your face immediately. I had scarcely stretched myself in the field when a deafening and frightening bellow was heard. The bull was near. All of us trembled and some kept anxiously asking, what's going to happen next? Fear not, lie flat, I shouted back. In the meantime, that personage kept on repeating these words, he who humbles himself shall be exalted and he who exalts himself shall be humbled. Something very strange made me mar marvel very much. It was this. So although I lay flat on the ground with my very eyes in the dust, yet I, I was able to see very well the things that took place around me. The bull had seven horns, almost in the form of a circle. My guide then shouted, We shall witness the effect of humility. In an instant, to our great surprise, we were lifted up into the air to a considerable height to where the raging bull would never have been able to reach. Those who had not lowered themselves to the ground did not enjoy this privilege. The bull made for them straight away and tore them to pieces. No one was spared. The moral of the story, those who humble themselves will be protected by God and persevere. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.